Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. Let's go through the process of glycolysis. This is where we take glucose and through a 10 step pathway, we turn glucose all the way into something called pyruvate. In actual fact, we turn one glucose into two pyruvate and pyruvate jumps into the mitochondria and goes into this cycle called the Krebs cycle. So pyruvate turns into something called acetyl-CoA that binds with something called oxaloacetate and produces the first product of the Krebs cycle called citrate. And there's multiple steps to this citric acid or Krebs cycle and it produces around about 32 to 34 molecules of ATP, that's energy. Now glucose turning into pyruvate produces some ATP or energy itself. It produces around about two ATP molecules or between two to four. And we'll go through that in one second. Now, in order to get glucose in, you need a glucose transporter, and I've spoken about that in previous videos, so take a watch. Glucose itself is a six carbon molecule, as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the very first step is to turn glucose into something called glucose six phosphate. What does that mean? Well, simply, we need to give a phosphate to glucose. Now remember, ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, has three phosphate molecules. We take one of them, turns it to ADP, as you can see there, diphosphate gives it to glucose and pops it on the sixth position. One, two, three, four, five, sixth carbon. And there you can see the sixth carbon, we have phosphate attached to it. That's called glucose six phosphate because of its position. Now the enzyme that does this is hexokinase in most tissues of the body. But if we're talking about the liver, it's called glucokinase. And we'll get back to that, very important. Now next step is that we need to rearrange some of these carbon atoms. And we do so with this enzyme, which is called an isomerase, swaps the carbons around and we produce something called fructose 6 phosphate, which simply means that the phosphate's still in the sixth position, but we've rearranged the carbons in a way that it now looks like a fructose molecule instead of a glucose molecule. Now, you probably know that glucose and fructose are nearly identical. They're both monosaccharides. The only difference is the carbons are rearranged. So this fructose 6 phosphate, what we do is we need to give it another phosphate. We do that by taking another phosphate from an ATP and we pop it on the first carbon position this time. So now what we have is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and we do it with an important enzyme called phosphofructokinase. Again, I'll get back to that, very important. Now that we've got a six carbon molecule with a phosphate on the first position and the sixth position, we need to split it in half. When we split it in half, we now produce two three carbon chains. One called dihydroxyacetone phosphate, that's got the phosphate on the first carbon, and another one called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, it's got the phosphate on the third carbon. Now the thing is this, dihydroxyacetone phosphate will always turn into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which means basically when you have one molecule of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it predominantly turns into two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. All right. Now this is where it gets a bit tricky. This glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, remember, it's got a phosphate on the third position. We want to give it another phosphate, but we don't do it through ATP. We do it with an inorganic phosphate, a phosphate that's basically just laying around. We give it to it using this enzyme, and so there you can see there's the phosphate now attached to the first carbon group and the third carbon group, so it's called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. But another thing happens here with NAD plus and NADH. So this is the thing. NAD plus is a molecule that has a positive charge to it. What that means is it's missing an electron. Remember, an electron is a negatively charged thing. If it's missing an electron, it wants to find one. And so it searches around the body, finds electrons, and pulls them off, all right? In this case, it goes to the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and it pulls a hydrogen off. And this hydrogen, like all hydrogens, it has one single positive proton and a negative electron but it pulls a hydrogen off that has an additional electron. So what you can see is that you could basically say that positive cancels out that negative, and then we've got one extra negative. So you could say that this is H negative hydride, right? And so what it does is the NAD negative steals a, uh, NAD positive steals a hydride, that negative balances out that positive, and you add a hydrogen and now you've got NADH. And because there's two of these, you turn 2 NAD plus into 2 NADH. This is important with the electron transport chain, which I'll do in another video. Now we've got this three carbon chain with a phosphate on the first and a phosphate on the third. Now what we do is we start to steal the phosphate back. So we take these ADPs that we've produced previously, we steal one phosphate away, we turn ADP into ATP, and this phosphate we've stolen from the first position, so now we're left with a three phosphoglycerate. But we've produced energy ATP because there's two of these three carbon molecules, we produce two ATP, great. Now what we need to do is we need to take that phosphate, 
change it from the third position to the second position. Now we've got two phosphoglycerate, and then what we do is we steal some water away from it. Water is simply two hydrogen uh, atoms and an oxygen atom. When you steal that away, you end up changing, you don't change what carbon that phosphate's on, but you change where it's attached on the carbon. So instead of being directly attached to the carbon, there's an oxygen in between, and that's why I've extended it here. So now we've got this phosphenol pyruvate, two of them, and we steal that phosphate off. And when we steal that phosphate off, again, we give it to the ADP and we produce ATP. And because there's two of them, we produce two ATP molecules. And what we've now done is we've gotten, we've gotten rid of one ATP, one ATP, but we've produced two and two. So net ATP production is two ATP molecules from all this. And what do we end up with? We end up with pyruvate, two of them actually, one glucose, two pyruvate, and that, like I said, jumps into the Krebs cycle to produce 34 more ATP molecules. Great. All right, next step is this. This is predominantly irreversible, uh, sorry, reversible, but there's some steps that are irreversible. This first step is irreversible from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is irreversible, and the last step from phosphenyl pyruvate to pyruvate irreversible, which means the enzymes are very important and they're the rate-limiting steps for glycolysis. Let's take a quick look, right? If you have a lot of glucose, it actually stimulates hexokinase and glucokinase. That's really important because it means that if you have an abundance of glucose in the bloodstream, it's gonna stimulate these particular enzymes to start turning it into glycolysis and producing energy. This is great. It also means that if you produce too much glucose 6-phosphate, it negatively feed back, feeds back and says, hey, stop doing this process. That's actually good, and a lot of negative feedback signals in the body. But it only does it to the hexokinase, doesn't do it to the glucokinase. That's important, I'll tell you why in a sec. Another positive stimulator here is that of insulin, unsurprisingly, because insulin wants to turn glucose into energy. And what do you think an, a negative regulator is here? Glucagon, which is released when we've got low glucose levels. If we go to phosphofructokinase, what you'll find is if you produce, if this pathway goes through too quickly and you produce too much ATP, it's saying, hey, whoa, slow down, too much ATP. So ATP is a negative, re negative regulator for this, all right? Which means that if you have ADP, too much ADP, that's gonna be a positive regulator for it, all right? Another negative regulator for this is if you produce too much pyruvate and too much acetyl-CoA, a too much citrate, so that means citrate can be a negative regulator for it too. Fructose 6-phosphate, that's gonna be a positive regulator. And fructose 1,6-biphosphate is gonna be a negative regulator. And again, insulin is a positive regulator, glucagon is a negative regulator. Now let's talk about this, right? If you produce too much fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it negatively regulates this enzyme. So it stops fructose 6-phosphate from turning into any more, right? So this accumulates, but it's in equilibrium with glucose 6-phosphate, it's reversible. So if this goes up, it turns into more glucose 6-phosphate, and that goes up. And if that goes up, it negatively inhibits the hexokinase in most tissues, which stops any more glucose from turning into glucose 6-phosphate, which keeps that glucose in the bloodstream, right? Great, but if we're talking in the liver, Glucose 6-phosphate doesn't inhibit glucokinase in the liver, which means any more glucose coming into the liver will continue to be turned into glucose 6-phosphate. So we turn into glucose 6-phosphate from here and turn into glucose 6-phosphate from here in the liver. This is really important because we store glucose in the liver as glycogen, firstly by turning it into glucose 6-phosphate. This is the stored form of glucose. Glucose 6-phosphate packed on top of each other forms glycogen. Now down here, the last step, what can inhibit pyruvate kinase? Again, glucagon. What can activate it? Again, insulin. But another important thing that can inhibit this is long-chain fatty acids of acetyl-CoA. Really important, which means if you activate beta oxidation, breaking fat down to produce energy, that inhibits pyruvate kinase and inhibits that last step. So this is a run-through of glycolysis and regulation of glycolysis.